Uh, let me say it is a real honor to be here today to talk with you all. Uh, the talks today have been tremendous. I, I wish I could have these kind of talks every day. Um, the, the effects of subthalamic nucleus uh, on dopamine regulation is something I would love to get into down the road. Um, Dr. Kamala with her work in exercise, we're going to have a little bit of that in, in, our, in my talk today. Uh, but you know, this is, this is for you, the patient, and I want to tell you what we're doing uh, with studying dopamine regulation both in Parkinson's models but also in aging. So we have aging-related Parkinsonism as well, which is going to affect actually a lot more people as we get older than Parkinson's disease itself. But our work at, at, at up in Shreveport, at what fascinates me is finding the commonalities of dopamine regulation between aging and Parkinson's disease. And so when we, take, when we talk about an old look and a new look at the problem, we're still looking at dopamine, but where we're looking at dopamine in the brain might be very important. So what are my guiding principles in, in our work? We want to understand molecular mechanisms of impaired circuits, and you've heard a lot about that today. If we identify a target, a, something that changes in a Parkinson's model or aging, can we target it and manipulate it if possible? And what would, that, what would the impact of such a manipulation be it pharmacological or non-invasive? And we'll talk a little bit about that today, just as other previous speakers have. What does that do to locomotor activity and motor function? And so again, we're going to try to focus on both aging and Parkinson's disease. They definitely affect dopamine regulation in the central nervous system. This is the first talk that you're going to hear where humans aren't involved. This is all rats. But rats have a basal ganglia as well, and they have dopamine neurons. And the effects of eliminating those dopamine neurons are very well established with well-established models. But there's a little bit of subtle differences in aging. And I think those differences in aging, though, might help us understand Parkinson's disease progression and treatment a little better. So what are the common molecular mechanisms for locomotor improvement? Can we get this from aging work and Parkinson's work? I'm going to touch a little bit at the end, towards the end of my talk on the impact of exercise on locomotor activity. You'll see that, like in humans, rats can benefit from it. And also with a uh, lack of, when, when it ceases, then we go, they go back down to where they were before. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Ingram, who I'm very uh, honored to have a collaboration with at Pennington, we're going to look a little, uh, I'm going to touch on some data. Wrong button. There's the laser. Uh, the effect of caloric restriction. And can we identify the common molecular mechanisms for locomotor improvement from those two non-invasive interventions. So getting to improving locomotion, the non-invasive approaches, um, we know that bradykinesia is, exhibits not only in Parkinson's disease, which is a cardinal symptom of Parkinson's, but also in aging. Uh, Dr. Ingram's work and, and others have shown that calorie restriction can reduce the adverse impact of aging on locomotor activity. And what Dr. Ingram and I have just done this past year is actually look at uh, what would happen if we initiate calorie restriction in, at middle age. Could we get the same benefits that, have seen, that we see if we initiate it over the course of a lifetime? And then touch briefly on exercise impact on locomotor activity. So this is a picture of the rat nigrostriatal pathway where it ends in the striatum. We infused a dye blue to highlight it here. So this is uh, the rat striatum. In human, it's further subdivided into putamen and the caudate. And then just like human, the rats have a very well-defined substantia nigra. And this red staining is actually the molecule that I'm going to talk to you about a lot today, tyrosine hydroxylase. Now, the one thing, when we talk about the new look, okay, this is about the new look, because dopamine has been really well-established to be a player in lo locomotor dysfunction, 
but most of the attention on dopamine has been here in the striatum and not in the substantia nigra. And I'm going to show you today some data from students in my laboratory that, ha that show that if we can target dopamine here in the substantia nigra through the enzyme that's involved with making it, we can at least transiently improve locomotor activity. So this enzyme is one that you will definitely leave Pennington today and, and, and know very well because it makes L-DOPA. And this enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase. This, this enzyme, tyrosine hydroxylase, is the rate-limiting enzyme in dopamine biosynthesis. And the first step before we get to dopamine is the making of L-DOPA in the central nervous system. So how is tyrosine hydroxylase affecting it, affected in aging and Parkinson's models? And can it be targeted to improve locomotor activity? So if we go into our aging work, what we saw and published almost four years ago is that we see an aging-related deficit not only in tyrosine hydroxylase expression only in the substantia nigra and not striatum, but we also see a decrease in something we call phosphorylation. And so phosphorylation is like an energy boost, okay? It actually is a, it's a phosphate that's actually bound to the molecule and activates it. It's, it's nature's way of regulating proteins that are already made in, in, the neur, in, in the neuron. So that way we don't have to make new proteins all the time or, or downregulate them. We have an instant way to regulate protein activity. And so what we see is that in aging, not only in, the, in, only in the substantia nigra, we see a decrease in tyrosine hydroxylase expression and phosphorylation. And we don't see this in the striatum. And we know we have bradykinesia in aging. So that's been the conundrum. Why do we not see, why do we see bradykinesia in aging as well as Parkinson's, but we don't see this tremendous loss or anywhere near it in aging like we do striatum in Parkinson's disease. And so we see, you can see here, there's this, it come, L-DOPA comes from tyrosine, and tyrosine hydroxylase is the enzyme responsible. So we ask the question, could a resulting deficiency of tyrosine hydroxylase protein or phosphorylation, hence activity, in the substantia nigra rather than a striatum here, play a role in aging-related bradykinesia? So your cinemet is comprised of both L-DOPA and carbidopa, so we can allow L-DOPA to get absorbed into the central nervous system. It's still, today, the gold standard for treating locomotor impairment in Parkinson's disease, made by tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme. So tyrosine hydroxylase really is very important here in affecting our ability to move. So how can we affect its expression or activity to improve our locomotor capabilities. So here's, here's the start of a new look at our old problem of not having enough dopamine. Every single one of these dots in the striatum and the substantia nigra, there's 14 rats. Every single one of these dots represents a rat. And we characterized their locomotor activity, well, we had a young cohort and an old cohort, over the span uh, eight months apart. So we looked at locomotor activity in these rats 17 different times, every single rat, 17 different times. And at the very end of the study, we analyzed dopamine content in the striatum and the substantia nigra. What we saw is that in the striatum, we had no correlation of dopamine to their locomotor activity here on the y-axis. But in the substantia nigra, the levels of dopamine correlated very well with their locomotor capabilities. So, how if dope, tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting enzyme for dopamine synthesis, so how can we target tyrosine hydroxylase? What molecules in the brain can we regulate or activate to affect tyrosine hydroxylase? The best example of where we have, gone, have come today starts from Dr. Riva, Rita Levy-Montalcini, Nobel Prize winner in 1986, 
She just died last December at the age of 103. This is her celebrating her 100th birthday. And what she discovered and won the Nobel Prize for was the effect of growth factors on neurons. And talks earlier today have touched on growth. You've heard, especially Dr. Camella, you've heard growth factors being mentioned, both brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and GDNF. Her work ha had shown that growth factors, if we take a neuronal cell and apply growth factor, we can increase its volume. And that was mentioned earlier in, in the most recent talk in the hippocampus. And also the things that neurons like to do, which is spread their dendritic arbors to make synaptic contacts. And she discovered the action of nerve growth factor. But in recent Parkinson's news in the past about 15 years now, this growth factor called glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor or GDNF has been shown to maintain dopamine function and have, has been affected in some, not all, clinical studies for improving locomotor activity in Parkinson's patients. What we know through research is that our habits and diet and exercise can help produce these growth factors. So let's look at what the common themes are on tyrosine hydroxylase regulation here in the substantia nigra in aging and Parkinson's disease. And can we target tyrosine hydroxylase, possibly through manipulating growth factors, to improve locomotor activity? So the first, one of the first insights that I'll start out with is something that, an ob observation that I made as a postdoc back at the University of Kentucky in the laboratory of Dr. Greg Gerhardt and Don Gash. When we give, and th this, was, this study came right on the heels of clinical, a clinical study out of England to show that GDNF actually improves locomotor activity scores in Parkinson's patients. So we did the work and we found that, I'm highlighting this data set here because this is the striatum versus the substantia nigra, and there was a tremendous increase on phosphorylation in the substantia nigra for that molecule tyrosine hydroxylase. That's the first clue. And then the second thing was in the substantia nigra, SN, there was GDNF actually increased the expression of its own receptor, GFR alpha-1 is what we call it. So every, every compound in the brain has its own receptor that then the receptor then sends that downstream signal. And here in this case, we've affected tyrosine hydroxylase activity and we've affected the expression of its own receptor. Now notably, and this is something that I want to point out now, this is a good point because I'm not going to, I don't have a slide for it. After you infuse GDNF, it's gone after seven days. This, these effects were observed 28 days later. So what did GDNF do to sustain this increase in phosphorylation and as previously shown in clinical studies and preclinical studies, increased locomotor activity? And are these critical targets, importantly, that affect our capacity to initiate movement? So going forward now with my own laboratory, my first student's first project, he's, he's now uh, has his doctorate and is finishing his MD. He'll be graduating uh, this year with an MD, PhD from LSU Health Science Center in Shreveport. This is data. I showed you the data about the dopamine in the nigra versus the striatum, how the, the, ni the dopamine in the substantia nigra was correlated to locomotor activity. We took these, we had sample left over from that study. And we wanted to know what the expression of that growth factor receptor was, and was there a difference between the striatum and the substantia nigra. And we saw that there was an aging, these are 12 month old rats versus 30 month old rats. So 12 month old rats like me, mid 40s, a 30 month old rat is gonna be close uh, to 80, between 80 and 90 years old. We saw an aging related decrease in this band, which is that soluble form of that receptor, and only in that soluble form of that receptor for GDNF. If we looked in the striatum, the same rats, we saw absolutely no decrease. So this gave us a clue that there might be an aging related reduction in the expression of this growth factor receptor in aging that might be contributing to locomotor impairment in aging. So can we take this GFR alpha-1 to improve locomotor function? So if we look at a rat's locomotor profile, just like humans, over time, although with a wide population variance, 
there is a general population decline with, as the rat increases in its age. And this correlates very well, as I showed earlier, with dopamine in the substantia nigra. So what we did in this study is took very old rats, between 24 and 30 months of, old, uh, months of age, and then intervening right here, infused this growth factor receptor, GFR alpha 1, into the substantia nigra of these rats, and determined if it had any effect on their locomotor capabilities. So one thing I mentioned is that rats, like humans, have a very wide range of basal activity. Some are more active than others. So when you do such studies like this, you have to balance out making sure that your treatment groups have equal representation and range of locomotor activity. And then you'll know that your data are, are as best as they can be. So this is, this is two groups of rats. And before we actually segregated into groups, we, we knew that they were segregated after we established who was going to go where. But you can see in October 2010, this co these cohorts of rats moved, had the same locomotor capabilities, averaging just about 4,000 units per locomotor session. Then on the day of surgery, we gave the GFR alpha-1 into the substantia nigra bilaterally. And then the day after surgery, predictably, they're not going to be very moving very well because they just had surgery the day before. But what we noticed that for the first four days after we infused this growth factor receptor, the rats that had the growth factor receptor moved more than the ones that got vehicle into their striatum or, or to their substantia nigra. So this was a pretty uh, amazing uh, effect, uh, but it was transient. It was transient. So did it wash out? Do we need to maintain it in the future? Well, let's first look at neurochemically what happened. So we repeated this study in the same age group of rats, but this time we infused the growth factor receptor unilaterally and then compared its effect against the other side using it, that as a control. So the first thing we see, if we infuse this growth factor receptor, we can increase the levels of dopamine in the substantia nigra. One nanogram of this, that's a very small quantity, um, into the substantia nigra increased dopamine but did not have any effect in the striatum. If we look at tyrosine hydroxylase, that rate limiting enzyme of dopamine synthesis, every rat that got G, which is GFR alpha 1, this is called a western blot, this is how we measure proteins in the brain. Every single rat that got the GFR alpha 1 had increased levels of tyrosine hydroxylase relative to its vehicle, but we did not see any increase in the striatum. So this new look might be, we need to focus our attention into the substantia nigra, regulating tyrosine hydroxylase and dopamine in the substantia nigra. That's what this suggests. And then we also saw an increase in phosphorylation in the substantia nigra as a result of this infusion. And in the five-day group, we noticed every, the, the effect on tyrosine hydroxylase and dopamine no longer existed. There was no difference. So this tr effect was transient, but nonetheless, we need to follow up on it for a more extended delivery. So that's our aging story. What do we see in Parkinson's disease and tyrosine hydroxylase regulation in the substantia nigra? So again, we're focusing on tyrosine hydroxylase. We know it makes L-DOPA. One thing that you've heard about and probably know well about as a patient is that this is a progressive disease. It happens over a long period of time before you actually have locomotor symptoms. And the field is really trying to pay attention to what are some pre-motor biomarkers or behaviors that we can quantify and identify that are reliable to predict that something is going on that will eventually predict locomotor impairment. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the challenge. But why is it also that you don't have locomotor impairment until you have a very dramatic loss of this protein, tyrosine hydroxylase? Why, why is that? Is there some sort of change in dopamine regulation that's going on to keep dopamine levels where they need to be until there's just too much tyrosine hydroxylase loss from the disease process itself. So the brain's response to this, this compensation, could be the best therapeutic approach. 
Why not follow what Mother Nature is doing? So, this is the, this is the situation, this dopamine compensation. Why do Parkinson's patients no so, so signs of no, no signs of bradykinesia until there's major loss of tyrosine hydroxylase? We ask the question, is there an increase in its activity? And we, I mentioned phosphorylation, so we, in this study we looked at the role of phosphorylation, how it might change in a Parkinson's model. Do we see increased TH phosphorylation? So here we go again. We're going to compare the striatum, where the terminals are of that nigra striatal neuron, versus the substantia nigra, where the cell bodies are. So if we do this classic 6-hydroxy dopamine model of Parkinson's disease in rats, we can create a loss of that tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme, TH, to equal levels. And if we compare dopamine, as I abbreviate dope, DA, between the striatum and the substantia nigra, you see that the loss of dopamine in the substantia nigra is half of what we lost in the striatum. We lose 82% of dopamine, but only 47% of dopamine in substantia nigra, even though the loss of this rate-limiting enzyme is, is the same. So what's the molecular, what's going on? If we look at dopamine, if we take the, remember this is a lesion, so we're creating the loss of tyrosine hydroxylase in both regions. But if we normalize that dopamine that's remaining to the remaining tyrosine hydroxylase protein, you can see that dopamine per remaining, that's what this measurement is, in the striatum, you see a loss of dopamine suggesting that tyrosine hydroxylase activity is decreased in this Parkinson's model. That's in the striatum, but if we look in the substantia nigra, SN, you can see that dopamine per remaining TH is actually increased. And then if we look at, is, something, is there a change in the tyrosine hydroxylase activity? This tyrosine hydroxylase activity increases, the phosphorylation increases in the nigra, substantia nigra, but not in the striatum. So again, this is telling us that what's going on in the substantia nigra might be very important for the dopamine we need to do, uh, execute normal locomotor activity. And that's the next step of this study is to actually do locomotor studies and try to target this response in increased TH tyrosine hydroxylase activity. So we have less loss of dopamine in the substantia nigra compared to striatum. So if we unify our findings in the aging work and our Parkinson's model, we could propose that what we need to do is an either enhance tyrosine hydroxylase expression, obviously that really is the key for Parkinson's patients to get that level of the enzyme up. Okay, you're taking the medicine that tyrosine hydroxylase makes, L-DOPA. So if we get that protein back, that's really what we ultimately need to do. But we could also potentially, if we can't do that, increase its phosphorylation its activity in the substantia nigra to help reduce bradykinesia and aging and possibly Parkinson's disease. And I have a student from Baylor who has won a Parkinson's disease fellowship uh, for the summer who's actually doing this growth factor receptor infusion work in Parkinson's in the 6-hydroxy model as we speak. So let's finalize our talk because we've touched on this uh, all day today. What about our daily habits of exercise and now bringing in calorie restriction? We know both of these activities can increase the levels of this GDNF, which has been shown in, in clinical and preclinical studies to have locomotor benefit. Our exercise research was, was funded by the NIH, and it's based on the observations that have already been shared by our, our great speakers earlier that treadmill exercise and Parkinson's models can reduce the impact of Parkinson's-like lesion on locomotor deficits. It does increase GDNF production. And so because of what, with our data, we think that GDNF's effects on increasing the expression of its own receptor, we might actually see increased receptor expression from doing exercise and calorie restriction. So if we do a modest, uh, compared to other studies, a, a much more modest 12-day regimen of exercise, just a half hour a day for our rats, we can actually increase 
their locomotor activity against their baseline. This is observed the first week after those 12 straight days. But if we let them rest an additional week thereafter, this effect is gone. So this, this theme has also been touched on in earlier talks. But the good news is, is that if you get the same rats exercising again on this regimen, their locomotor activity then increases again. So it is, it can come back. This effect of exercise can come back. And so what we're doing right now in our work, uh, my student Jennifer is looking at doing this very paradigm and then looking to see if we can affect tyrosine hydroxylase in the substantia nigra and increase its expression and its phosphorylation. And also key, key ingredient here, the expression of this growth factor receptor. Now, our work with Dr. Ingram uh, has begun uh, last year, and we have locomotor data to report. And we are now, in my lab as, as we speak, looking at the neurochemical indices that were affected uh, from this intervention. So what we did is we started calorie restriction, which also increases GDNF production, uh, at middle age. So this is what somebody might be able to do to potentially stave off Parkinsonism as aging increases. So we did this for a total of six months or 24 weeks, and we monitored their activity, their locomotor activity against their baseline every six weeks. Our control group was just rats that ate as they pleased. The calorie restriction was 30%. So that would be AL, ad libitum fed rats. Every six weeks, their locomotor activity significantly declined against their baseline. But in the rats that were 30% calorie restricted, we saw absolutely no decrease in locomotor activity capabilities. So now we are investigating to see if there was an increase in GDNF expression, its receptor, and tyrosine hydroxylase in the substantia nigra. Some of the things that you, if you look at this data some more, you might ask, is this molecular trigger, if you will, pulled sometime after six weeks? Because zero to six weeks in the ad libitum, we're already seeing a significant decrease, but not here. The other thing is, is what we're looking at now is looking at this molecular pathway that ultimately gets the tyrosine hydroxylase. But here's another thing that came out of looking at this data. Again, I mentioned about the rats having a wide range of locomotor activity, just like humans. So our couch, the couch potatoes of that group, the ones that don't move a lot at baseline, were they more or less affected by calorie restriction? The answer is that they were the most affected by calorie restriction in a positive way. So if we compare the locomotor activity of these rats, characterizing them by calorie restricted low, which is the couch potato, calorie restricted high, which are the Bruce Jenner's in the group, and then against the ad libitum couch potatoes and the ad libitum Bruce Jenner's, this is their departure from their both baseline locomotor activity. After six weeks, they are already increased above their baseline in their ability to move, and it continues out to 24 weeks. I have the 18-week data here, but we can confirm that it's actually out to 24 weeks. This, this effect from calorie restriction is sustained. Now, the interesting thing is that the Bruce Jenner's of the group actually started to crash, just like the, the, cow, the, the, peop, the, the rats that ate as they wanted to after the first six weeks, but then after 12 weeks, they got back to their baseline and stayed there. But you can see the ones that ate as they wanted, they continued on a slow progressive decline. So there's hope for couch potatoes. <laughs> so if we look at our data combined, the aging and the Parkinson's disease data, Decreased tyrosine hydroxylase phosphorylation and expression in substantia nigra appears to be an important molecular component in aging-related bradykinesia. We see decreased tyrosine hydroxylase expression in Parkinson's model, as we would expect, but there's also an increase in phosphorylation in substantia nigra. Is this involved with this compensation? So until you can have all this phosphorylation going on, during the progression, but eventually the TH loss might be too much to overcome. 
because number one, Parkinson's disease more or less is a disease associated with aging. So the increase in phosphorylation may not overcome the de this increase in tyrosine hydro decrease in tyrosine hydroxylase expression that we know happens in Parkinson's. However, we can increase, as our aging work uh, has shown from Scott Pruitt, that increasing expression of tyrosine hydroxylase with this growth factor receptor, GFR-alpha-1, can, when it's infused in the substantia nigra, we can increase at least transiently locomotor capabilities in aged rats. We have evidence that, and we're continuing to gather it, that exercise or calorie restriction may prevent aging-related bradykinesia, and something Don Ingram and I are planning is to do a little bit of both. Maybe 15% calorie restriction and uh, a less rigorous exercise paradigm. Maybe we get the same effect, some synergy. And as I mentioned earlier, a summer, summer fellow who, from Baylor is now testing to see if this growth factor receptor can actually restore the loss of tyrosine hydroxylase protein, that protein that makes L-DOPA. Don't forget it, tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, can we get it back? Not, can we, not only can we prevent it, but can we get it back? Can it restore its expression? That, that would be key for treating Parkinson's disease. So this is the muscle behind our work. This is my student, Tanya from Swarthmore College. She's about, uh, well, she's less than a year from defending her proposal. Jennifer has, is doing our exercise work. She is from Kansas State. This is now Dr. Scott Pruitt, who's finishing up his fourth year in medical school. My wonderful lab technician, uh, Victoria. And this is Katie Owens, who is now doing the Parkinson's Disease Foundation Fellowship funded work with the growth factor receptor in a Parkinson's model. And I would like to thank the National Institute on Aging for funding our work uh, together with Don Ingram. Uh, I've received previous grants from the American Federation for Aging Research to get this work going, Parkinson's Disease Foundation, and some internal grants, at competitive grants at uh, LSU Health Science Center in Shreveport. And uh, our collab my collaborator and, and friend Donald Ingram and his excellent assistant Jennifer Terrebone and Corey Wanfalo, who is a summer student for the calorie restriction and exercise work. Uh, when the times get tough as they often do in science, uh, with peer review and grants and papers, I also have personal connection with Parkinson's disease. This is my mother, who is uh, in year 11 of Parkinson's disease, lives in Cleveland, Ohio. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And